Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at Movie Armaments Group up in Toronto, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, movie guns and gear supply houses in Canada. And uh, their owner, Richard Collins, has a complete Stoner 63A system that he has offered to let us take a look at today. So what you're seeing here is probably the almost the uh, the most well-recognized version of the Stoner. This is the light machine gun pattern. But the whole purpose of this design was one receiver that could be configured into six or seven different types of firearm. And we have the parts to show you every single one of them today, which is going to be really cool. So we'll start with a little bit of basic history on the gun. This was of course a design uh, conceived by Eugene Stoner after he had done the AR-15 or M16. Uh, he had been working for the Armalite company, part of Fairchild, and they sold the AR-15 patents to Colt. And so at that point the gun's pretty well developed, Stoner needs something to do, and he's got the idea for a modular gun, which is obviously what you see here. He first put this together as a design he called the M69W, uh, cleverly noting that that designation looks the same when you flip it upside down, because the way that his modular gun worked was that you could take the receiver and if it was right side up, it was in magazine feed configuration where it would feed from the bottom. If you flip it over, you could then build all the parts back on the same receiver, but it could feed from the top from a belt fed mechanism. And this would allow you to have a gun that was a carbine or a rifle or a survival rifle, um, and also an automatic rifle, a light machine gun, a medium machine gun, or a vehicular fixed machine gun. Now the M69W never really went past the prototype stage, but he used it to enter into negotiations with the Cadillac Gauge Company. They were interested, and in 1961 they signed an agreement with him, uh, and basically he went to work for Cadillac Gauge developing this cool modular weapons idea. The first actual version that they put together was actually the Stoner 62, as you might suppose in 1962, and this was effectively this gun but in 308 and 7.62 NATO caliber, which made in some ways made more sense from a military perspective than the 223, because as a medium machine gun in 7.62 NATO, it could fill a role that yeah, you can't quite fill as well with 5.56. Things like a vehicular machine gun, anti-aircraft capability, those things are a lot harder to do with 5.56, a lot harder to justify than 308. Anyway, uh, people weren't really interested in the 308 though. This was we're starting to be on the the cusp of um, of the the small caliber revolution in military armaments. Of course, the AR-15 has been sold to Colt. Um, and it's going to become obviously a breakthrough thing. The US military is going to be adopting it. And worldwide, what Cadillac Gauge found is that people were far more interested in this gun as a 5.56 than as a 7.62 millimeter. So they went back to the drawing board a bit, and actually, with the help of the same two guys who had helped design the AR 15 from the AR 10, Bob Fremont and uh, James Sullivan, uh, they scaled this gun down to what we see today as the Stoner 63 in 5.56 caliber. So before we dive in and take a look at all the different configurations of this gun, I want to take a minute and discuss what its actual history was with the US military. So starting really pretty quickly right off the bat, the US government, the US military showed an interest, and DARPA bought like 25 guns in 63 uh, for testing, so very early in this thing's life cycle. Uh, that testing didn't result in anything specific, but the gun would go on to be tested by the Army, they did some testing at Aberdeen. The big test of this was by the US Marine Corps in 1966, and they actually bought several hundred guns and they issued them out to L Company of the 3rd Marine Battalion, 1st Regiment, 1st Marine Division, uh, as for a field trial in Vietnam. And these guys had the guns for about three months. They had 27 machine guns, 12 carbines, and 135 rifles. And the carbines went to the officers of the unit, uh, while the machine guns and the rifles were spread between the men. But they had both the belt-fed machine gun version and also the magazine-fed what was called the automatic rifle version. And in very short order the marines came back and said this automatic rifle version is nonsense, there's no point to it, and we'll just here take them back, we'll get rid of them. And they went on for the remainder of the test with magazine-fed rifles, traditional pattern rifles, and belt-fed light machine gun versions. And they're both they're, they're weapons that are popular, but they also have some handicaps. These were relatively finicky guns to keep running. 
Um, they had to be well lubricated. They had to keep be kept clean. They are not the bomb-proof guns that are perhaps more viable for a military force in ongoing active combat. And that's the biggest reason why you would see this really not adopted by the U.S. military outside of uh, special small elite groups like the U.S. Navy SEALs. Because, by the way, the SEALs did also, the SEALs actually formally adopted the Stoner as the Mark 23 uh, machine gun. And they would put it to, they, they'd become uh, fairly notable using these in Vietnam. The SEALs are the one element of the U.S. military that did formally adopt and use these guns. And in fact, I believe they used them until the early 80s uh, when they finally phased them out of service. But the SEALs were guys who were willing to understand the, the peculiarities of the gun. Uh, they were willing to stay on top of its maintenance and deal with all of those hassles, so that overhead, in exchange for the benefits that the stoner brought, namely weight. This is a remarkably lightweight gun. Uh, in its light machine gun configuration like this, it's 11.7 pounds, and that's like nothing. That's like four pounds less than a, a 249 saw. Um, and, and the SEALs ended up actually often using the shorter, ver shorter barrel, cut about four and a half inches off the barrel. Um, that version was, was typically called the commando version. That cut something like a pound and a half off. So you're talking about a, a belt-fed 5.56 machine gun that weighs about the same as an M1 Garand. And that was a, a very appealing uh, compromise to make. So, um, ultimately, the gun would never be accepted by the U.S. military beyond the SEALs. Uh, there was a, a trial in the early 70s for the SAW program that would end up adopting the FN uh, Minimi as the M249. On Stoner's recommendation, Cadillac Gage opted not to try and enter the Stoner 63 into that trial. Stoner, Stoner saw from the way all of the the military procurement had gone that he didn't think this gun actually had a, a legitimate chance in that trials, and he was almost certainly right. And that was pretty much the end of the Stoner program. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the details of this, and we'll also get into talking about when this changed from the 63 to the 63A, because there are substantial differences between the two, and it's important to distinguish between them. But first, let's look at the modularity. So there is a lot to cover on how this whole system goes together. So we will start with just the receiver framework, and that's what we have here. Permanently mounted to it are a couple components, the gas port, uh, the ejection port dust cover, and a couple blocks back here. This block serves as the barrel latch, so we have a spring in there and a big round peg that goes through into the trunnion and locks the barrel in place. We also have this square little uh, lug right there. That is the front magazine catch. For the magazine-fed versions, the stoner uses its own proprietary magazine, because it is a rock and lock magazine, which was essential for the modular uh, concept here. You couldn't have a straight push-in magazine because that requires a long magazine well like the M16, and you can't have that long magazine well hanging off all the time when you're trying to, say, put sights there or put a belt feed adapter there. So uh, there is a little square hole in the front of the magazine. That is uh, hooked by this little lug. We have another uh, permanent block uh, located here, a little bit farther back. That includes the ejector, just one ejector for all different configurations of the gun. And it's also actually got a little mounting slot right here. That slot fits this little guy, which is the hold open device. So you don't have to use the magazine hold open, but if you do want it, it can be installed right there and it will cause the, mag the, the bolt to lock open when the magazine is empty. However, this actually interferes with mounting the belt feed unit on the gun. So that's why it is fairly easily removable. If you want to change this into a machine gun, that little guy's got to go. This does, by the way, uh, point out, uh, again, how this is not intended to be a field-changeable sort of system. This is something that the armorer sets up as whatever pattern of gun you want, and then it runs that way until it's taken back to the armorer. We have a couple of attachment points here at the back. Those are to fit uh, whatever sort of buttstock you want to put on the gun. They had, well, we'll go over all the different versions in a minute. We have a lug here which supports the charging handle. We have these three sets of mounting holes at the top. 
uh, which are there to attach, well, all manner of stuff. Um, uh, trigger groups if you're in machine gun configuration, and sights if you're in uh, rifle configuration. And all of the markings are up here on, I guess you call it the top? There isn't really a defined top to the receiver. Uh, they're all marked Stoner 63, including the 63As, they didn't change the designation. Uh, manufactured by Cadillac Gage in Warren, Michigan. Uh, the early ones were actually made in Costa Mesa, right about number 230. Uh, the whole project was looking like it had a, a long and successful future ahead of it, and so Cadillac decided to move the operation uh, from Costa Mesa, where Armalite had been, where Stoner was, out to one of their larger plants in Michigan. That's when that change took place. Uh, in total there would be about 2400 of these Stoner 63s, the early ones, manufactured, and then about uh, 850 of the Stoner 63As. And this specific gun is a 63A. Interestingly, these lugs here, this one and this one, would remain on virtually all of the guns, in fact all of the guns. Um, but the only purpose of this is to act as a mounting point for the tripod adapter for the medium machine gun version. And that's one of the patterns that was pretty much dropped right off the bat. Very few tripod adapters were made. Uh, we'll take a look at one in a minute, but it's interesting that those mounting lugs remained on the guns all the way through production. And last but not least, we have a gas tube here at the front. So, um, obviously all of the different configurations are gas piston operated, and so they all require use of that guy, and it's permanently mounted to the receiver. Now let's start taking a look at some of the individual components and how they differ between the different patterns of the gun. So what we have here are of course two different fire control groups, but this one is set up for a rifle or carbine, and this one is set up as a machine gun uh, fire control group. And the major difference here is that in its machine gun configurations the Stoner 63 series fires from an open bolt, which is what you would want for a machine gun. It gives better cooling, and it prevents the possibility of cook-off by never having a cartridge sitting in the chamber heating up waiting to get so hot that it fires. In the rifle configurations you want exactly the opposite, because you don't want to have the bolt slamming forward when you're trying to make a nice precise shot. So in the rifle and carbine configurations the gun needs to fire from a closed bolt. And in order to do that, Stoner set up two different sets of parts, both in the same trigger housing. There's really a lot of engineering ingenuity that went into this gun. So this one is our machine gun uh, group, and you can see it just has one sear in the back. And when you pull the trigger the sear goes down, that allows the gun to fire. When you release the trigger the sear comes up, catches the bolt, and it stops firing. Very simple. In the rifle or carbine version here we have some extra bits at the front uh, in the form of a hammer fired system. So there's a hammer, and there is an auto sear here, so before it will fire in full auto you have to trip the auto sear, then when you're holding the trigger the hammer will go forward. When the bolt cycles back it's going to recock the hammer, then when the bolt goes forward it trips the auto sear drops the hammer and continues to fire. Now the selector switch here is full auto and semi-auto, and that's one of the differences with the 63A and the 63, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But um, one other thing to note here, the, the mounting pin for the rifle, or in this case specifically the carbine system, has this long protrusion on the left side. That is actually the mounting point, or the locking point, for the stock. Stoner made both fixed stocks and side folding stocks. And the side folding stock has this hole in it with a little wire spring, so that when you fold the stock open it will actually grab onto, or it will lock onto, this peg coming out the side of, uh, well, kind of the middle of the receiver once this is mounted in the gun, and that's what actually locks, uh, locks the stock in the folded position. So in order to actually fold this you grab these two pegs, squeeze them together, and then the stock folds like so, and it just snaps back into the extended position. So you've got your, your spring detent there to hold it folded, and these two latches to hold it in the extended position. Both types of stock have a lug here that loops up underneath that crossbar, and a locking pin on the bottom, so you just hook that in there, push 
the stock through and then pin it in place. So you can shoot, uh, shoot these, basically any of the configurations with a fixed or a folding stock. Or if you want the, uh, like the mounted machine gun, the vehicular or aircraft mounted machine gun version, well of course you don't want a butt stock. Instead, for a setup like that, you need the gun to be solenoid fired. So this, the way this is designed is that when this solenoid fires, it pulls this in, which pulls the trigger, this trigger bar, backwards, like so. And that is why there is a hole uh, cast into every single Stoner 63 trigger. This bar drops into the hole right there. And that's how it pulls the trigger back. Now, in order to make this work, you actually remove the pistol grip because this doesn't quite fit in place with the pistol grip in there. But that's you know, if you have a, a vehicular mounted solenoid fired gun, it doesn't need a pistol grip on it anyway. So that is the setup for the mounted gun. I should also point out that the selector here works great in uh, the hammer fired mode, but for the machine guns, there is no semi-auto. So if you don't have the hammer installed, semi-auto or full auto, this works exactly the same way. Um, it's always in full auto. All right, now let's take a look at the actual operating bits, the bolt, bolt carrier, and gas piston. We have two of them here because there is yet more cleverness in this system that needs to be shown. Now first off, um, there's actually a series of tungsten weights that are somewhat free-floating in the, uh, the gas piston, and those act as an anti-bounce device, which is in its own right rather clever. But when it comes to the modular aspects of the gun, what we really want to look at is up, up close in here. So notice that these two are oriented the same way, except that these parts are 180 degrees different, and uh, that is very deliberate. So this is set up as a rifle, and this is set up as a machine gun right now. And there are, so a couple things to look at. First off, this uh, geometric feature right here, this shark fin looking piece, is the element that actually trips the auto sear. So if you're firing full auto with a rifle, you need something that is going to trip this little guy right there, which is what allows the gun allows the hammer to fall in full auto for each subsequent shot. So when you've got this, the bolt configured, the, the bolt carrier configured in this way, as this goes forward, it's going to hit that lever right there and trip it. Now when you've got this reversed for the machine gun configuration, that fin is up here and it does nothing, which is fine because, well, there's no auto sear, uh, or there's no auto disconnector in the full auto trigger group. But there's one more aspect to this that's clever that we need to consider. When you've got this all the way locked in battery in the rifle configuration, the firing pin is flush with the bolt face and nothing happens until you actually push on the firing pin, and then it comes through the bolt face and fires. That's what the hammer is there to do. On the machine gun version, however, when you rotate this piece 180 degrees, it actually cams the firing pin farther in and locks it in place, because in the machine gun mode, this has a fixed firing pin that's always protruding. So it's going to pick up a cartridge in this configuration, it's going to push it into the chamber, it's going to rotate and lock, and the moment that it's fully locked, the firing pin automatically protrudes without being hit by any hammer, which is good because in the machine gun fire control group there is no hammer, and it's going to fire and then start the cycle over again. And the sear engagement surface as a machine gun is here on the opposite side. So that is how this thing is set up to fire uh, as a closed bolt hammer fired gun as a rifle and as an open bolt. Uh, full auto weapon as a in the machine gun configuration. Now when it comes to charging handles there are three different versions that we have to talk about, and this is one of the many areas where the stoner design and history get kind of complex and messy. So uh, basically what we have here is the original 63 charging handle, we have a 63A rifle charging handle, and then we have the SEAL Mark 23 machine gun charging handle. So. All of these are actually mechanically working the same way. There's a little lug here on the top of the operating rod. The charging handle dovetails basically into that. These are all non-reciprocating, so they allow you to pull the handle back, and or pull the bolt back, and then the handle goes forward. These all have a little 
uh, spring steel clip here at the front that hooks into this bracket on the receiver. which locks the charging handle in the forward position when you're shooting. But originally on the Model 63, uh, this was the charging handle for all models, and it was a side-mounted charging handle. So it's got a little round cutout here that hooks over this lug on the side of the receiver, and it's going to snap in there, and it operates like so. So it'll snap into place in the front, non-reciprocating, and then you can use it to charge the rifle. And uh, in machine gun mode, it was on the right side, like this, and on rifle mode, it was on the left side to be charged like this, and it was all all good. However, um, they decided to that that this was uh, less desirable. So one of the changes of the Model 63A was to set this aside for only machine gun use. And in rifle use, they would instead have a top-mounted charging handle that would sit up here. If we put on the rifle handguard, you can see that this sits nice and, and high up on top. It's got a little cutout in it so it doesn't interfere with your sight picture. And that was the 63A method of charging the rifle and the carbine. The machine guns, like I said, maintained the side charging handle. Now, a problem with this charging handle showed up when the SEALs adopted the Mark 23, which had a right-hand feed system, which I'm just loosely holding in place here. But you can see how having a belt hanging out of this feeding gets in the way of that charging handle. So what they did at that point was to take that existing rifle charging handle, extend it so it was a little bit longer, mount it in the same place, right there, and then cut a big slot in the bottom of the handguard so that this guy could now fit right through, well, again, we'll just hold this in place. This would now extend below the handguard on the machine gun version and not interfere uh, with the belt feed system. So that's the third variety, which is specifically for the right hand feed machine guns as adopted by the SEALs. Now. Let's look at sights. There are three different versions of sights uh, that were set up on the guns. So of course the belt feed models have the sights mounted to the belt feed unit itself, which is then pinned onto the receiver. And all of these, by the way, are aperture sights. So we've got a left-hand belt feed and a right-hand belt feed. We'll go into a little more detail about the, why they made the change from one to the other here. We then have the standard sights for the rifle version, which is just a rear, a two, two position uh, flip rear aperture sight with this uh, lightweight uh, system of wings to protect it. The reason that this sight has to be so long is because it needs to use these standard spaced push pins to mount to the top of the receiver. And then, of course, we also have the automatic rifle version, which is magazine fed but with a box magazine from the top. Now the reason to do that is because the automatic rifle presumably is going to be fired primarily prone from the bipod, and it's a lot easier to change magazines on a, a configuration like that when you're shooting that way. It's a lot easier to change mags on the top than on the bottom, especially if you have a two-man team uh, with your gunner firing and your assistant gunner reloading. Um, that's, there, there is good reason why there were so many top-fed light machine guns during like the World War II era and the 1930s, the Bren, the Nambus. Um, these are guns that really took advantage of the speed of a, a two-man team reloading this way. However, of course, that means your magazine's in the middle, which means your sights have to be offset to the side. So the rear sight's offset to the left, and the front sight is similarly also offset to the left. These are all windage and elevation adjustable, and they're really good sights. Alrighty, for barrels, uh, there are five versions. We've got four of them here to show you, but you can see all the elements. Um, at the very top we have the carbine barrel. This is 15.7 inches with a bayonet lug. Um, and then of course it's got its uh, adjustable front sight, flash hider, everything you would expect. Note that we have this hole here at the bottom. This is where uh, the barrel catch is, holds onto the, the barrel. Right below it we have the rifle barrel, which is basically the same thing but 20 inches long. Again, with the locking hole in the bottom. 
when we get to the bottom two, now we're now we've flipped the gun over into machine gun form, and so now the locking hole is going to be on the top, because the lot there's only one locking catch on the receiver, and it's it's going to catch the bottom of a rifle barrel or the top of a machine gun barrel. So uh, both of these machine gun barrels are also 20 inches long. They have carry handles on them, which have can be set up either with the handle up on top or folded over to either side. This is the Bren gun barrel, so its front sight is offset to the left. You'll notice it has the same flash hider, but it's a substantially heavier profile barrel, because it's intended for uh, continuous fire. Then lastly, at the bottom, we have the actual machine gun barrel. Now, the one that we're missing here is what was called the commando barrel, which is 15.7 inches, but the heavy weight, the heavy profile of the machine gun barrel. Um, and the one extra thing that we see here that we don't see on any of the others is this guy, which is a gas regulator. So this is very similar to the gas regulator on the late pattern Portuguese AR-10s. Uh, use a bullet tip to rotate it. You have three different positions, and this is important and necessary to the gun, uh, because in, in this, the belt-fed machine gun version, you've got a lot of extra drag on the action, because you're pulling a belt over, where all of these other types are using a magazine that has its own spring and, and pushes rounds out of its own, on its own power. With the belt feed, you're, you're pulling a lot more energy out of this gas system to operate the gun. So it's important to be able to adjust the gas pressure if your belt is dirty, or the gun gets dirty, um, something that's not, not as relevant to the, the other configurations. So you saw that every version of the, every pattern of the barrel has a bayonet lug. Uh, these are designed to take a standard M16 pattern bayonet, which of course makes sense in context. However, one of the, the latest, one of the last iterations of the stoner was developed by NWM in the Netherlands, and they actually produced their own proprietary bayonet for, well, not proprietary, they produced their own pattern of bayonet uh, that would also fit all of the stoners. Uh, and this is basically a copy of the AKM bayonet with the the wire cutting setup, the uh, two clips back here. So it's pretty cool to be able to have one of these that we can show you, because those are pretty rare bayonets. Now these bayonets were actually subcontracted out to a company called Solingen, which made bayonets for a whole bunch of rifles. And uh, the way you can identify a specifically stoner pattern is that little squirrel logo above uh, the letters NWM uh, in a Mauser-like banner. So. So when the Stoner 63 was first introduced, it fed the belt-fed version fed from the left side. This was traditional, typical, it's what you would expect. Um, however, there was a little bit of a wrinkle in this, because the receiver had to be modular and interchangeable with the rifle version. And in its rifle configuration, the gun needs to eject out the right side of the gun to accommodate right-handed shooters, which meant when you flip it over, now in machine gun configuration, it's going to eject out the left. Well, it's also feeding out the left. And what this meant was you don't want the, you've got a belt coming in here, and you don't want the empty cases to interfere with the belt coming in. So there's this uh, it, you know, deflector plate here. Cases will come out this side, bounce off that plate, and go down. Well, the one hiccup was occasionally a case would come out, hit this, and actually bounce back into the ejection port and cause a malfunction. And at the time they were calling these spin-back malfunctions, as in the case uh, hit that plate and spun back into the receiver. And this is a problem they would ultimately, well ultimately not really solve until the Mark 23, the very last military iteration of, of the stoner. And what they did on the Mark 23 was they reversed the whole thing, so it now fed from the right and ejected from the left. So let's touch on this in just a moment, but first, when we look at the left-hand feed system, uh, we have a feed tray here that has this little notch in it. Ammunition was supplied in these plastic boxes. Uh, this is a 100 round box. They're fairly fragile. Uh, let's see, yeah, this one's got a big old crack in it down there. Uh, and the way this worked is you, you had the lid that could come off, and when, when the ammunition was being issued or carried or stored, you held the lid on like this, and it sealed it up very nicely. When you went to actually shoot it, you would pull the lid off, and then flip it around, and put it back in on this side, and then 
That covered the top of the box and kept dirt and, and junk out, but it left you this nice little opening where the belt could feed up and out. And you've got this bracket on the side there, and that hooks into your feed tray. And then as long as the feed cover is closed, this box can't come out or fall off. And all of the ammunition is nicely protected. Uh, this is a good system, again, except for one potential issue, which is that all the weight is hanging off the left side of the gun. This was exacerbated with uh, the larger 150 round box uh, ammunition carrier, which really put a lot of awkward moment on the, the left side of the gun. Uh, and that was, that was, well, that was the downside to this system. Now there was a, a solution that was put forth, which was a, uh, a separate bracket uh, that held a round, 150 round circular uh, drum carrier. And that positioned that drum center line below the gun. However, it wasn't quickly detachable like these plastic boxes were. So the trade-off was you could have the gun uh, awkwardly off balance with 150 rounds on the side, but easily reloadable. Or you could have the gun better balanced with all of the ammunition centered in the gun, but when you needed to reload it, you pretty much couldn't take that drum bracket off. And if you need to reload, you'd, you'd have to have a spare belt like wrapped around your shoulders uh, or something like that. Now the Mark 23 solved this issue by switching from left hand to right hand feed. Uh, this may be non-traditional for uh, Western or American machine guns, but it, it certainly worked better in this case. And then you'll notice that they don't have, it doesn't have that mounting bracket hanging off of it. Instead, the bracket was a separate piece right here, which actually attached to two of the bottom pins on the receiver. Sorry, it should be this direction. It has a protected feedway going up the side, which we can pop open. And then you could instead, you can now take these hundred round boxes and slide them into this mounting piece right there. And when you mounted this on the gun, now all the weight was once again centered. So now with this arrangement, you have all the weight centered. Uh, you have a right hand feed, so you have no risk of ejected cases bouncing back into the gun. And this pretty much solved all the problems. This was also uh, relatively quick and easy to reload. You just open that, pull out the now empty box, and reload it with a new full box. Now for the medium machine gun configuration, where you've got the, the stoner set on a tripod, you of course need a tripod. Well the US military had lots of uh, browning pattern tripods, so uh, Cadillac Gage made up a tripod adapter, which is this. They only made something like 20 of these originally, and very few of them exist today. Uh, if you see one of these around, it's probably a reproduction, because there was a batch of repros made uh, by one of the, the big active stoner guys. So. Uh, what this does is make use of these two side trunnions on the gun, as well as that little hole on the bracket on the gas tube. So that hole fits on this peg right there, and then these guys drop into locking brackets right there. We have a spring detent right there. Those drop into their little receptacles. The front end of the gun is locked in place right there. And presto, your stoner is solidly locked onto a tripod for precise long range fire. So a couple other elements to show you. Now that we've got the gun together here as a belt fed, uh, we can lift up the top cover there. And then the way you would actually feed this is by opening this panel. This is of course the Mark 23. This is the last version uh, as adopted by the US Navy SEALs. You have your belt box down here. You're going to open up the lid just like we talked about. You have your belt uh, coming out here, and then that goes in there. And All right, you then take your ammo out of the belt box, pull it up, lay the first round across there. Top cover goes down, and as long as the bolt's back, you're ready to go, because this is a push-through uh, type of belt. So when you pull the trigger, the bolt's going to go forward. It's going to strip this round out of the link, shove it into the barrel, and fire it.
I also want to talk briefly about the bipod. Uh, this is there's a little more to this bipod than meets the eye. So it clamps onto the gas tube here, but this also has a little spring-loaded catch right there. So when you collapse it like this for storage in a pouch, it locks itself in this position. So it's not going to be trying to spring open like an HK G3 bipod or a, one of the closed pin M16 bipods. Sorry, not an HK bipod, a Sentme bipod uh, or a M16 closed pin one. Uh, to open it up, you squeeze it, push the lever, and then it pops open and it locks in the open position as well. So once you have it clamped around the gas tube, it stays there until you push the button to remove it. Uh, once it's in place, of course, it will pivot uh, on the gas tube and you can also extend and contract uh, the legs. We've got a, a button right here, push that in and can slide the legs out and they have adjustable increments of about every inch. Now, when you see pictures of these in use in Vietnam, you generally don't see the bipods. Uh, in, the, in the jungle combat environment in Vietnam, the bipod just wasn't really all that helpful. Um, guys tended to shoot these either from the hip or from the shoulder uh, because they were light enough that, that that was very feasible, or from the belt box in the case of the Mark 23. On these guns, because you've got this metal bracket hanging down below the gun that's actually attached to the gun, you can rest the thing right on that bracket and it works as a pretty darn good de facto rest. And that was, for the few times that a rest was necessary, apparently that was really the more common, uh, the, the better option than carrying around and using the bipod. In use with this belt box, you don't have to take it off. You just slide the, the, uh, the ammo box out, put a new one in. However, if you do want to remove this bracket, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, we have a button here, squeeze that, and then pull it forward, and that whole assembly just pops right off the gun. It's held in place by these two half-circular uh, points which lock into these two pins uh, on the bottom of the receiver. So the one last thing I do need to talk about is the difference between the 63 and the 63A. Um, and these, these changes came about as the result of the findings from the Marine Corps' three-month-long uh, company-scale combat trial in Vietnam in 66 or 67. Uh, and let's see, starting from the beginning, uh, they got rid of the side charging handle on the rifles. They kept it on the machine guns for the time being, but they replaced the rifles uh, with a top-mounted charging handle. They made a, a one of the more substantive changes is what they made to the uh, the rollers on the back of the bolt carrier. On the original 63s, there are two rollers back here, and they are uh, inflexible, so they don't they don't move. As a result, in order to close the top cover, you had to have the gun cocked so that those rollers fit into the uh, the channel here in the feed system. Well, on the 63A, they dramatically improved this system by replacing this with a single roller that's spring-loaded, so it can push down. So you can now close the top cover with the bolt either forward or back. Uh, if you close it with the bolt forward, it will push down. When you charge the bolt, it'll pop back up into position in this channel. They address some reliability issues by making a couple changes to materials. Uh, in particular, the bolt and the uh, gas tube uh, were, were made with a stainless steel on the 63A, uh, which was a, a change from the original 63. They nitrided the barrels, which extended barrel life quite a bit. They added the gas regulator here on the machine gun barrels on the 63A. They added a dust cover to the ejection port up here on the top cover on the belt feed. Uh, perhaps one of the other more really significant changes they made was to the fire system, the, the control system. So on the 63s, you had a three position selector that was safe, semi, and auto. On the 63As, they swapped that around. So you have a two position selector, which is just semi-auto and full auto, and then they moved the safety to be an M14 or M1 Garin style of uh, safety lever in the trigger guard. So they split this control into two. This is safe fire, that's semi and full. All right, well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this somewhat exhaustive dive into all of the different components that make up the Stoner 63 or 63A 
platform and system. Um, I'd like to give a big thanks to Movie Armaments Group, and in particular, Richard Collins and Charlie Taylor, uh, who run the place, uh, for giving me access to this. And even more than that, uh, we are actually going to go out and take this thing to the range and do some shooting with it in several of these different configurations. So definitely stick around tomorrow to see that awesome video. Thanks for watching.